Good morning. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let us open the first session. This is the plenary session of an international conference, the Future of Information Security, Info Forum, Forecast 2021. You can see the title of the conference. The Organizing Committee of National Forum for Information Security uh, put this conference together with support of the State Duma of Russian Federation. Uh, we also enjoyed the support of the presidential administration. The conference is supported by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Presidential Administration Department uh, for Development of ICT and Telecommunications, uh, FSB of Russia, the Ministry of uh, Digital uh, Technologies, and a number of other government agencies, including uh, the uh, Department uh, of uh, Construction Organization known as Digital Economy, uh, Rosatom, and uh, several other organizations. Uh, we also get support from the uh, Trade uh, Chamber of Russian Federation. I think this is uh, quite a long list that tells us a lot about uh, the level of this international event. Uh, we have Chinese partners. We have representatives of several departments of Huawei, a Cloud Security Alliance has also made a contribution to this conference. The Association of Cybersecurity and Shanghai Social Sciences Academy. This is a face-to-face -face event, and we are also working online. In today's situation, which is highly unfavorable due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we are able uh, to have a much bigger audience by the way of using internet. This also keeps the participants safe. Uh, all presentations are going to be translated into the English language. We value this opportunity to talk about relevant issues of digital transformation. We want to talk about uh, different approaches uh, to digital transformation. The main task of this conference is to talk about information security. For a number of years, we have held our conferences in China. This was a very useful experience. Many participants have told us that uh, we had an opportunity to meet with representatives of Chinese business. We talked uh, to representatives of different organizations. This was a very valuable experience. We are going to continue this tradition, but now we are hosted uh, here in the suburbs of Moscow. We see that uh, China continues to uh, show interest to this collaboration and exchange of knowledge between Russian and Chinese experts. This is a good tradition of experience exchange between the two countries. Yesterday, we took a presentation from Huawei. Uh, it uh, was delivered in this room. We had an opportunity to uh, see what the government in China did uh, to build ICT uh, business. We heard a lot of things that are very relevant to us, uh, things that we could use in this country. In Russia, we also have quite a bit of experience in the field of information technologies, and uh, we also have uh, quite a lot to share with others. As you know, there is an intergovernmental agreement uh, between 
Russian Federation and China. It's an agreement uh, on uh, collaboration in the field of information security. This is a good base uh, for practical work between different organizations, uh, between companies and experts. Uh, a lot of the work is done to establish common standards, uh, to uh, create common approaches uh, to different types of work. This conference is going to make a contribution to this uh, process. This session is going to last until 12.30. Uh, now I am uh, going to ask all presenters uh, to be well disciplined. Uh, please stick to the time slots that uh, you are given. We don't have a lot of time and we want to take many presentations. We want to get a lot of information. We are going to take 12 presentations. Uh, all of them are very interesting indeed, and uh, I don't want uh, to interrupt anyone. Uh, please uh, be on time. We are going to have minutes of this conference. If you have any proposals, in the next three days, please send your inputs. We would accept your feedback in any uh, format that you are comfortable with. In the afternoon, we're going to have another session with presentations and panel discussions. I encourage everyone to participate. This is going to be very useful, I assure you. And uh, we will have time to network, to just talk to each other in this uh, wonderful environment in this beautiful location. So let us start without further ado. I would like to pass the floor uh, to Alexander Zubarev, who is the Director for Information Security at Huawei Russia. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Miroshnikov. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is a great honor for me to pass the greetings of uh, Huawei's president, Mr. Aiden Wu, uh, to all participants. I'm happy to welcome the organizers and the participants of this uh, conference on information security. Uh, the subject of this uh, conference is extremely relevant today. Uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we had to change the format of this conference and uh, uh, find a new location for the conference venue. Uh, still, uh, this is a good opportunity for communication between experts uh, who work for different organizations. In this conference, we are going to review risks uh, that uh, present themselves in the new digital reality. We will talk about the process of digital transformation, about uh, e-economy, e-governments, Science and technology move uh, mankind forward. As we develop innovations, we uh, see that the centers of the world uh, are uh, moving uh, from uh, one geography to another. We are entering uh, the uh, era of uh, fourth industrial revolution. We are entering the smart world. This has become possible uh, due to developments of technologies like uh, 5G, new generation, new generation networks, artificial intelligence, and big data. Altogether, these technologies are going to give a new impetus to economic development, and uh, they will bring men uh, forward closer uh, to building of a new society. Uh, President Putin has signed uh, a decree on the goals of national development uh, until 2030. Economic development, uh, training of human resources are some of the main priorities. Uh, Huawei has the capability uh, to implement most daring plans in very many fields. If we bring our efforts together, we are going to accelerate Russian research and development programs, and this would be good and beneficial not only for Russia but for the entire world. Huawei has always been a very open country, and in the next five years we are going to be very supportive of our Russian partners. We will do a lot uh, to build our common digital future. Together, we will build our future uh, through development of ecosystems, and we are going to do that in the most secure way. 
we're sure that the knowledge that we have in the field of cybersecurity uh, is going to be useful and relevant uh, to Russian uh, economy. Uh, we wish every success uh, to all participants of the conference. I hope you have a lot of interesting discussions on matters of digital development and cybersecurity. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. And now I give the floor to Nikolai Murashov, the next speaker. He's the chief of the NKCKI. He'll be talking about our new threats to info security caused by new and recent digital technologies. Thank you. Well, digital technologies are now part and parcel of our everyday life. And against the background of the pandemic, digital technologies have, become, have been playing a leading role, a key role in our lives. Online payments, work from home, people are communicating with their employers online, online government services. Well, we've got used to that. However, we need to think about security of these transactions and these operations, particularly when it comes to the Internet of Things and artificial intelligence, internet, internet banking and others. The industrial Internet and the Internet of Things is the order of the day today. It is autonomous. It works on its own seemingly without interacting with the user. Well, this brings about several threats to info security and loss of control over some of these operations and processes. Well, this is complemented by the breach of confidentiality and the broad availability of personal data and information as a whole particular when it comes to Bluetooth and Wi-Fi or updated protocols. And the Internet of Things is fraught with new threats to security, so the spread of malware. The Internet of Things co combined with proxy servers means that users can actually conceal their actual location and can make use of fraudulent techniques to obtain information. Communication protocols, particularly when it comes to wireless protocol, protocols, they are also fraught with cybercrime. This time, the federal program, Digital Economy, in the Russian Federation um, sets forth a whole number of new standards to control the Internet of Things. And this program pays a lot of attention to security, information security. Information security indicates that, well, some of the issues remain outstanding. If we do not pay close attention to security issues, well, the malware and fraudulent actions and cyber attacks may actually take more ground in our lives. Technologically, we need to uh, spread machine learning, neuro uh, networks, and statistical networks in two phases. First, the first stage is learning. The second stage is actual operations. They should be based on the new logic when there is so-called the poison pill which is in inserted at the entry of a close information center. They may feign legitimate use of systems, but the poison pill will actually spoil the operation of the entire network. We uh, should also mention deep fakes here. 
neuro networks of face recognition, which in combination with artificial securities can actually feign their credibility and play authenticity, whereas they would be deeply fraudulent in essence. Well, this is uh, synthetic images in e insert interface rec recognition algorithms are also fraught with many grave consequences. Fraudulent attacks on neuro networks like uh, the ones we have already witnesses are potentially dangerous. This is a very severe challenge, particularly when we consider that the learning of neural networks is a very, requires painstaking efforts. It is a labor-intensive and lengthy process. Well, if we need to extract some data from neural networks, we can face the leakages of sensitive or confidential data, personal data first and foremost. Well, there are several ongoing trends. Uh, what biometric systems need to be further protected? the security not to be improved so that uh, our rights, uh, our rights are protected too. The San Francisco initiative and other initiatives underway in the European Union deserve close attention. The Council of Europe and the United Nations are paying close attention to artificial intelligence. And they, these debates are focused on new ethics and protection of private lives, protection of privacy, particularly when it comes to Convention 108 plus of the Council of Europe when it comes to processing and storage of personal data. The OECD has a set of recommendations on the artificial intelligence, and Russian experts were involved in their development. And the protection of personal data was, again, a key element discussed by the OECD, by developers and operators alike. We need to make those systems extra secure. And the Russian uh, Federation program, Digital Economy, is also paying adequate attention to network security. Commercial and government organizations occasionally lose data which are stolen by fraudulent operators. And this is compromising. This is something that compromises them. Well, critical information infrastructure needs to be totally secure because this is a sine qua non for the stable operations. In that sense, we need to create a develop and phase in a system to protect the integrity of data and those networks. We need to commission new regulations to facilitate this task when designing and deploying those information systems and improving their security. I should further emphasize that new technologies appearing in various spheres of our life are running ahead of security measures we undertake. For many technology companies, the development and marketing of their new technologies are the prime objectives, whereas vulnerabilities may be patched up for many years after they were originally launched. Colleagues, I only mentioned a few of the outstanding threats. I believe that my colleagues will mention many more other outstanding threats in our discussions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Nikolai. That was a very comprehensive presentation. 
And the next speaker will be delivered by uh, Aisalo Badjagina, who is the chief of the regulations department, the Information Security Department, Ministry of Digital Development, Communication, Mass, communi mass Media of the Russian Federation. She will be talking about the protection of personal data in artificial intelligence. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the floor. Could you launch my presentation, please? Okay. Oh, welcome to all participants in the Info Forum um, conference. On behalf of the Ministry of Digital Development, I'd like to thank you for paying so much attention to uh, digital security, information security, the protection of personal data. Uh, I believe that our expert discussion will help us have a better picture of the status of security in protecting personal data. Okay, we are paying so much attention to human rights protection and protection of human rights in the digital environment. This has become becoming a very topical issue. Well, and it would be appropriate to remember uh, the Council of Europe Convention, Convention 108, on the protection of private and personal data. The Russian Federation actually endorsed uh, and ratified that convention back in 2001. This convention uh, emphasizes the need to protect privacy of individuals and that this should be supported by national rules and regulations to protect personal data from fraud. Well, the Russian legislation is based on the principles of processing personal data uh, based on international obligations of Russia under Convention 108. Well, there are several principles in place, the legitimate uh, collection and storage of personal data, they use for legitimate purposes only, and they are safe processing and storage. And other parties to Convention 108 keep working together to improve the safety and security of data. That's recently, the Russian Federation signed a protocol uh, amending and adding uh, Convention 108. That should include the collection and storage of biometric data and many other aspects of this issue. We need to improve and integrate this updated convention in our legislation and bylaws, especially when it comes to transborder transfer of biometric data and other personal data too. We are we, we, we're currently working on that and we are taking into account the position and advice of the Council of Europe. We're working together trying to improve the standards of personal data protection. Like I mentioned before, technologies have been developing at an ever-growing pace, and this includes the collection of personal data and artificial intelligence. And I think this requires some extra effort to further protect personal data. So Nikolai Nikolaevich, before me, already mentioned the presidential decree, which introduced the national strategy of artificial intelligence. 
uh, the use of technologies should take care of the safe and proper development of artificial intelligence. All technological advancements should account for human rights, right to work, right to acquire knowledge, right to acquire new skills, and to conduct transparent and legitimate research. Government Resolution 2129 stipulates that there should be a well-maintained balance between the need to make use of personal data for the sake of artificial intelligence development and protection of privacy and human rights. Many experts have emphasized that the artificial intelligence that is based on personal data and personal information should also look after human rights, something that is guaranteed by our national laws and international legislation, international obligations of the Russian Federation. We should be very careful in protecting most sensitive data, the special categories, as they said, like, like our medical data and biometric data, which are unique, unique, which uniquely identify an individual throughout their life. Because this is something which is fraught with many a risk to individuals. Next slide, please. According to item 49 of the strategy, a comprehensive system of public relations based on artificial intelligence is to creating a favorable environment for its further development. There is a federal law 123 on experiments on artificial intelligence. This federal law introduces several amendments to Article 6 and 10 of the law on personal data. Also, there is a recent law on new experimental regimes in the sphere of innovations, which has been drafted by the Ministry of Economic Development. It is essential to note that this experiment, the experiments we are now talking about, is to test and improve the regulation of personal data protection and social relationships we, in conjunction with the development of artificial intelligence. And we believe we need to complete these experiments, obtain and process their results, and this will give us a chance to further improve and upgrade these pieces of legislation which I have just mentioned. The Duma is now considering a bill on, 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 on giving more latitude to Roskomnadzor in terms of personal data protection and safekeeping. But as we are trying to further develop artificial intelligence, we need all data operators use uniform methodologies. Our next slide, please. Well, there are several legislative initiatives underway, and while considering those initiatives, we want to keep them in balance to protect individuals uh, from the onslaught of digital technologies. We are cooperating with federal authorities and our business community so that we know better and better understand the requirements of the business community and see whether the new technological developments are to the benefit 
of our people. Next slide, please. It is also so good that we are creating a common legal in, in legislative environment regulating that. International cooperation will be considered in the second part of our conference, but now I would like to identify only a few key points. We, are, we have now embarked on the way to uh, uh, ongoing cooperation with the OECD. We coordinate our legislative initiatives with the OECD. And to, do it, to, to this end, we are monitoring our current legislative initiatives and bills considered by the legislature. We are coordinating our efforts with relevant OECD committees, committees and commissions. We want to make use of their advanced and most elaborate competences. We want to create a common statistical base. The OECD has a set of recommendations um, regarding artificial intelligence and where making due account of them. We have included them in the National Strategy on Artificial Intelligence, and they are related mainly to the protecting and safeguarding human rights. The artificial intelligence is getting a lot of attention in uh, BRICS and Shanghai uh, cooperation organization. Well, this, these items are also in the agenda of annual BRICS summit meetings. And it has been emphasized by BRICS that all member countries should pay adequate attention to artificial intelligence. And uh, these issues will be high on the BRICS agenda in the coming year, 2021. The Council of Europe is also paying a lot of attention to artificial intelligence. A special committee on artificial intelligence was established at the Council of Europe to enhance and promote cooperation on artificial intelligence drawing on the experience of all member countries. We believe that Russian experts on uh, artificial intelligence and Convention 108 will help Russia make its position known on all these issues. And this will also facilitate a timely analysis of ongoing issues. I would like to say once again thank you to federal authorities and to the business communities gathered in this room. Thank you. Thank you. Are you ready to take one question? Yes, please. Thank you. I'm Timur Aitev. Thank you for a most interesting question. A couple of months ago, the Minister of Digital Development announced a project on a, a project on the, 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 the pandemic uh, information to all individuals making use this personal sensitive information. What about this project now? Is it underway or not? I believe that this is something that will require the involvement of our parliament and some further amendments to existing laws will be required. To, to my grave regrets, I do not know anything about this project that has been duly announced. Let me find out with my colleagues and I will get back to you later today and will update you on the current status of this project. Well, but, but anyway, I believe that this project will be are uh, deployed in line with, the, with our with, with human rights. We'll certainly look after human rights. Thank you. Do you have a question? A question. 
А инженерная группа, пожалуйста, подготовьте следующий процесс. I'll please get ready to, to, to the next broadcast. And will you use the microphone, please? Alexei Volen has announced he's no longer working at the Ministry of Digital Communications. Will this ensue any changes in your policies? Furthermore, I believe that blockchain is fraught with many more problems than any others. Because, well, cur the current law uh, says that any user may actually revoke their previous consent to use their personal data. With blockchain, this is not viable. First, Alexei Volen was mainly working with mass media. He was not dealing with personal data at all in his work. So our department will work as it has been. Re as regards your Second question. The artificial intelligence technologies are still underway. They're still incipient. And bylaws and regulations are also in the making. Therefore, I believe that we are still laying out a roadmap and we are drawing on the international experience. It's only afterwards that we'll be actually introducing that in our bylaws and regulations. We will also be experimenting with assessing all risks and false potential. We'll, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Please take your seat. So, colleagues, are we ready to launch the next speaker? The next speaker is a remote one. Are you ready? Okay. Yelena Martinova who is the Deputy Chief Federal Service of Cadastra, the so-called Ross Register. She will be talking about the information security as a key component of the digital infrastructure of Ross Register. You have the floor. Thank you. Удаленно. Я очень рада приветствовать всех вас на конференции Инфоформа будущей цифровой трансформации. И это прекрасная площадка для диалога и обмена экспертными мнениями и лучшими практиками использования информационной безопасности. Хочу сказать огромное спасибо организаторам, которые системно и блестяще справляются с организацией форума. И я вот вижу среди участников тех, коллег, с которыми мы встречались не так давно очно в Сочи. Поэтому очень приятно в да, такой дружеской обстановке сегодня с вами увидеться, хоть и виртуально. В условиях цифровой трансформации, которая сегодня происходит во всей системе государственного управления, первостепенную важность приобретают вопросы информационной безопасности. A very big role for Roth Register. Information security is one of the key tasks that we see in the process of digital transformation. Uh, this is the first chart uh, that uh, has a few numbers that illustrate the scope of our work. We are one of the biggest public agencies. We have almost 55,000 employees. We are uh, very serious about the process of digital transformation in our organization. We have 15 core services that we provide. Uh, we are a supervisory body and we work in uh, seven main areas, including five areas uh, for public authorities. There are uh, two services that are offered uh, to the public, registration uh, of cadastral deals. We uh, serve more than 55 million individual customers every year. Uh, these services are provided electronically, and we have plans uh, to uh, convert other services on our menu to the 
electronic form as well. Uh, we uh, offer four services per second. Uh, we get uh, 1.5 billion inquiries every year. We currently have 32 separate IT systems in our agency in supervisory and uh, control organization. We uh, do very many different functions. Uh, land uh, supervision is uh, one of the areas where we do about 240,000 inspections every year. There is a big journey that we still have to travel. We believe we have a lot of potential uh, to improve our systems. This week we had a very important event. On October 21, uh, we have uh, completed uh, the transition uh, to the single source of data on real estate. Uh, this uh, was the task uh, set by the President of Russian Federation. We had to complete this work uh, before the end of the year. We had a lot of legacy systems and we had to do data migration uh, from all those legacy systems. This was a very uh, big piece of work. We. Uh, work together with regions and we very much appreciate their inputs. Uh, all the employees of the uh, agency who work in different locations uh, have worked very hard and that allowed us to support the tight schedule of this transition. We uh, can never hope to have a perfect deployment. It always takes a lot of effort and a lot of uh, resources. Uh, we uh, did uh, quite a lot to train our human resources. We do a lot of work at faraway locations. We send teams of experts uh, who act as coaches uh, to the people in our local offices. Uh, this year uh, we have uh, switched uh, to a distributed uh, network organization. We currently have several data centers, which is in line with the uh, data security requirements uh, for public agencies. There is another big task that we are faced with. Ross Register is not the only organization. Uh, this is a general uh, project of digital transformation. Uh, this project should be completed uh, by the end of 2023. We're putting together uh, one common architecture for data storage. This will address uh, very many different uh, domains. We will be uh, implementing new technologies. We'll be using AI and machine learning algorithms. One important line of work is improvement of uh, customer service. We want uh, to do this and support the highest level of information security. There are several principles that we follow. Data protection, keeping information intact, and at the same time, it should be accessible at any point in time. Today, in our agency, we have several ways of protecting information. We uh, look at the best practices out there, and uh, we do many things uh, that uh, other agencies are also doing. Uh, some uh, people believe that uh, the uh, tools provided by uh, international vendors uh, work better. We are counting on the domestic uh, developers. We want to rely on the uh, Russian security products. We need some improvements uh, in the laws uh, to achieve a higher level of info security. We see uh, new threats coming up every day, uh, zero day threats and several other things uh, for which we have no uh, solid protection yet. Previous presenters said that we have to act uh, rapidly. We have to be proactive. We need to remember about possible human errors. This is always uh, a 
danger that's uh, relevant to all our organizations. And uh, we have to address this amongst other things. Uh, we uh, want to educate our people. We want uh, them to be aware of the information uh, threats uh, that are out there. We do uh, process a lot of information. I have shown you some numbers in my first chart. We have a huge volume of information that we send and receive from other agencies. There is a very large number of correspondents uh, that uh, send us data and that we send data to. This uh, gives us very high responsibility uh, for data protection. Uh, the level of protection should uh, be uh, at least as good as uh, in other government organizations. We need to act consistently. Currently, uh, we have uh, another project we are preparing uh, for a new project. We are building a centralized uh, info security uh, project. We are now developing the concept. Uh, we are preparing some baseline documents. Uh, for this. Uh, this is a big task and uh, we work very hard uh, to make it happen. In 2021, we are planning to uh, generate a common uh, info security policy. We will uh, have a number of common processes. We will change our uh, processes. We uh, will have uh, specifications for all the tasks and all aspects of our operation. Uh, let me tell you uh, quickly about uh, some of the key components of our work. We are very focused on training of our human resources. Uh, they need to be aware uh, of information security uh, threats. Uh, this is a very important task. The users of our systems play a very big role. Uh, the uh, documentation, the documentation management uh, should follow simple and uh, clear rules. We uh, plan to use uh, new algorithms of data analysis. We will be using artificial intelligence. Uh, we believe that there are very many simple operations uh, that can be done by robots. Uh, we believe that AI and machine learning can be very helpful in incident handling. Uh, AI and machine learning would also be uh, very uh, useful uh, in uh, maintaining uh, the technology uh, state. We will be replacing uh, foreign software uh, with uh, Russian uh, software all around. We will be building new partnerships uh, in uh, the sphere of information security. This is extremely important. It's uh, essential to have uh, partnerships with other government agencies and with the professional community. We need to build an ecosystem and we need uh, to talk to other people, discuss uh, ways of responding uh, to various threats. We should use uh, the same standards in our efforts. Uh, this is the top level information security uh, structure. Uh, there will be a state system of detection, uh, prevention, and elimination of computer attack uh, consequences. Uh, we uh, have an agency, a data center for ROS register. Uh, the coordination of all efforts will be carried out centrally. And uh, we have a territorial uh, systems at uh, our uh, regional locations. They are subordinated uh, to the uh, central unit. These are some of the key components uh, of the information security system that we have at Ross Register. 
you can see the main pieces that we put, plan to put in place uh, to provide uh, integrity of the system. Detection, prevention of intrusions, antivirus protection, registration of events, uh, protection of uh, uh, storage uh, systems, access control at uh, remote offices. We maintain uh, the catalog of all users, uh, which includes information uh, on uh, their access rights and privileges. Uh, we uh, have an analytical uh, system that is uh, what is known as vulnerability scanner. We uh, conduct uh, testing of the security. We have different uh, levels of rights uh, that we assign uh, to uh, individual employees. Uh, we make sure that everybody is uh, getting uh, as much access uh, as one needs in his or her line of work. Uh, we have uh, cryptographic technologies, and we uh, certainly all use digital signature. I uh, am coming to the end of my short presentation. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me uh, to this forum. We hope that uh, the situation will be changing for the better, and we will once again have an opportunity uh, to have face-to-face -face forum. This is very useful for building new partnerships in the field of information security. Well, I believe that that definitely deserves a round of applause. Thank you very much. Uh, time is running fast, so without further ado, I'm passing the floor to the next presenter, Mr. Yi Li, uh, an executive uh, vice president uh, of uh, Cloud Security Alliance. Chosen 从今年年初开始，全球大多数国家都遭到了新冠病毒的传染，情况非常严重。确诊和死亡的数字不断的攀升，一些国家在陆地之间的边界也被关闭了，国际航班大幅度的减小。而且国际旅行者一般还需要两周以上的隔离。当然，业界现在在做疫苗的研发，但是从目前情况来看，可能需要更长的一些时间，整个这个疫情也许会持续到明年或者多多年。在这种情况下，啊，很多业务受到了影响。那么在线技术现在被广泛的运用起来了，比如大家从家里做远程办公、参加的会议、呃，那个参加一些个教育课程，还有像。医疗等等啊，都是大量的通过远程在线技术来完成的。那么在这种情况下，网络安全和信息安全的攻击和事件的数目也在急剧的增加。呃，根据联合国有一个统计啊，大概网络安全呃这个。攻击的次数在疫情期间 
大概增加了百分之三十到五十。另外呢，有百分之七十五的这种犯罪组织，呃，估计都是来源于美国。下边呢是几个例子啊，一个是呃大家可能都知道的啊 ，Zoom 是非常那个用用的广泛的一个。会议工具啊，那么 Zoom 开会的时候，啊，呃，很多这个黑客进来捣乱，这个叫做 Zoom 炸弹。另外呢，呃，前一段时间，呃 ，Twitter 啊，很多名人账号遭受了攻击，啊，呃，黑客用他们来做钓鱼，收取呃比特币 Bitcoin。嗯、呃，那么。在下边呢是俄罗斯啊，呃，一个这个调研的情况，在这个疫情期间啊，这个很多安全事件啊都有发生啊，这个对业务的影响是非常大的。那么最近。我们还看到了有技术脱钩啊这样一种趋势啊，这也造成了很大的安全挑战。嗯、呃，在前年哦哦二零一七年啊，当时卡巴斯基实验室在美国政府呃受到禁用。那么去年二零一九年啊，美国又呃做了这个国家紧急状态的宣布啊，呃，禁用华为。那么今年呢，更多的啊，中国的公司啊都被美国禁用了啊，包括奇虎三六零，这是一家安全公司。那么九月份的时候啊，美国政府又禁止呃 TikTok 啊、抖音还有啊。WeChat 微信，啊，在美国的使用，呃，中国呢也反制啊，宣布了，呃，这个一个禁止美国公司在中国做业务的一个策略，呃，下边也是有两个例子啊，一个是华为啊，在九月十五号的时候啊，呃，全球的。芯片就不能够，呃，得到供应了，呃，所以这个业务像智能手机，啊，华为 Mate 40啊，就会受到影响。呃、右边这个是，也是九月份，呃，美国政府啊，呃，宣布禁用，呃，微信和抖音，啊 ，WeChat 和 TikTok， 嗯、呃，那么现在也正在，呃。法庭里边打官司啊，这个会对，呃，美国的很多，呃，华人有很大的影响。呃，那么我再把中国的安全状况，特别是最近的啊，给俄罗斯和各国的朋友们介绍一下。呃，一个是在法律法规和标准方面。2017年啊，《中华人民共和国网络安全法》出台，这是呃中国的最重要的一个国家层面的安全法律。哦，去年秋天，呃，中国出台了《云计算服务安全审查办法》，啊，这是一个强制性的呃法规。再有呢，去年12月。呃，等级保护 2.0 啊，在中国全面实施。今年的一月一号，《中华人民共和国密码法》也执行了。在今年六月份，《网络安全审查办法》也开始实施。这主要是对关键信息基础设施的审查。七月份，《中华人民共和国数据安全法》啊，这个草案
也公布了，最近个人信息安全规范啊也开始在中国实施。除了这些重要的法律法规标准，还有大量的啊这个国家安全的标准规范啊也已经推出。在安全技术上啊，这是右上边。中国现在认识到了啊，这些技术是安全发展的关键技术，包括可信计算、拟态防御、零信任、安全智能编排啊，这些技术实际上在中国以外啊，呃，特别是在欧美已经开始呃比较比较普及。右下边呢是中国安全市场的一些情况，啊，那么去年，啊，中国的安全市场，呃，达到了，呃，一千多亿人民币的规模，啊，增长率在 17% 以上。网络安全公司啊也非常的多，啊，到今年已经有了三千多家做网络安全的，呃。大小公司、初创企业，那么在网络安全行业从事全职工作的啊，这已经有了超过十万员工啊，但是目前还有七十万以上的缺口。那么很多业务啊，还有场景啊，都是需要安全的啊。中国现在在发展新基建。企业上云啊，工业互联网等等啊，这些与网络安全保障啊都是非常强相关的。接着，我想把联合国和云安全联盟 （CIC） 的一些观点介绍一下啊。现在大家看到的是今年联合国秘书长。发布的数字合作路线图，这里边有三大部分啊，呃，中间 protect 啊，这里讲的就是数字安全和信任，所以安全从联合国的框架来讲是一个非常重要的方面。那么从 CIC 角度啊，我们认为安全是数字经济业务的保障。那么从业务来看，呃，最下边是由新兴技术构成的基础设施啊，是我们的这个土壤。那么这个平台就是互联网啊，是地表。那么之上是用一棵树来代表，呃，各个行业的呃枝节树叶啊，这里边呃。举了些例子，比如金融、零售、能源、电信、教育、工业制造、交通、农牧业、医疗健康等等啊，这些行业呃可能会有数数十个，非常的多。那么数字经济要发展，那么需要安全来保障的啊，安全实际上它是一个生态啊，需要整个产业链啊一起来维护。啊，从呃最上边，联合国各国政府、非政府组织啊，对呃像审核、监管啊标准方面建立，再到下边啊数据的拥有者、管理者啊，像各个企业本身还有用户啊，呃是数据的主体，呃、啊、另外用户的身份非常重要啊，他可能需要呃、啊、各国的。呃，公安机关、警察局啊，还有身份供应商啊，来参与。呃，再有就是安全产品与解决方案的呃供应商。另外还有云服务、云平台的服务商、安全的设备厂商，再有就是安全的芯片、半导体制造制造商，整个产业链。一定要一起协作啊，才能
把数字经济的安全保障做好。那么最后啊，我想就提出啊一些呃建议，呃，这是针对俄罗斯和上海合作组织国家和企业的。呃，我们认为啊，这前边看到的这些安全挑战啊，各个企业。是不能独善其身的啊，自自己单打独斗啊，是力量很薄弱啊，是需要更广泛的合作。呃，另外呢，呃，中国与俄罗斯还有很多上合组织国家啊，这个在领土上也是非常接近。嗯、呃，所以呢，永安全联盟 （CIC）、GCR 大中华区。啊，呃，希望能够与呃 Info Forum 加强合作啊，并能够吸引更多的合作伙伴啊，一起来建立国际安全的标准，呃，并提供像呃培训、咨询、审计呃方案等等的一些服务啊，这为我们的这些呃会员单位提呃在。呃，中国、俄罗斯还有上合国家家的啊，这些个企业啊，能够更好的提供服务。所以呢 ，CIC 云安全联盟啊，将把大中华区的总部啊迁移到上海啊，并且呢，我们希望啊，能够把 CIC 的上合组织分会也建立起来。啊，另外呢，呃，可以与上合组织的国家和企业啊，成立呃与技术和标准相关的研究院啊，这是我们联盟的一些想法啊，希望有兴趣的啊企业和组织啊跟我们联系啊，我们的呃邮箱是在这里 ，info at。c dash c i c dot c n 啊，我今天的分享啊就到这里啊，呃，如果呃各位听众有微信啊，也可以加入联盟的微信公众号，谢谢大家。Thank you very much, Mr. Yelly. I do not have any statistics available on me, not at the, on the, at the tip of my fingers, but we believe that several hundred of our colleagues are watching this conference online, and this is a very good sign. This is a good achievement in itself. We further believe that we need to keep up the prestige of our um, conference, and we need to maintain the high quality of all presentations and our proceedings. Well, the technical hitches may actually be annoying. It's well, 5G is, uh, is not available, and this is the reason for, for, for these technical hitches. But we are still in for the bright new future. As regards the materials that you have received in a garden not without a stutter, they will all be published uh, in the internet. They will be uh, uploaded online so that you can make use of them in the future. So, can we? Can we keep on? Because we are in for most exciting presentations, and everybody's looking forward to it. Because we were actually very excited to hear the presentation of Mr. Zubarov, the role of law enforcement authorities in the federal project information security. So, 
Nikolai, are you ready? Are you ready? Yes, you're ready. Okay. Please, please over to you. J just, just a couple of words. A couple of words. I want to introduce you. Nikolai Vladimirovich is the Director on Information Security, the um, Digital Economy Non-Commercial Organization. So I think I will have to stay at the lectern and speak into the microphone. So I will tell you more about the role of law enforcement authorities in implementing in implementing the federal program of information security. I will not be reading out. I will speak off the top of my head. And the digital economy is one of the 13 federal program which is managed and governed by special scenarios. Well, there is a resolution 1288 and resolution 124. Uh, all operating under the federal project information and digital economy. And of course, government authorities are involved in the implementation of these strategies. So what I'd like to pay your attention to. Well, our uh, non-profit organization does not use a penny of the government funds. However, the federal government of Russia has made a contribution to us as a non-property contribution. Next slide, please. What we are doing? We set up working groups, competence centers, and you will see more on the next slide, but at, at the moment I can see that each competence center involves from 100 to 500 different experts specializing in various areas of their expertise. And they are drafting uh, materials, they are discussing materials for the benefit of the military servicemen. I can say that Roman Valerievich, who attended our proceedings yesterday, was included in uh, the working group, and uh, our colleagues from Center 8 were there. And Roscom Nazor, Roscom Supervision, and the regional administrations are also part of the working groups. And they consider various materials, the materials which are to be included in national projects, also the results of our efforts. Next slide, please. Let me tell you more about this national program and how many projects are included in the federal programs. Well, there's inf information infrastructure and uh, experts for the digital economy, regulations, and information security, digital technologies, artificial intelligence, digital regions, it is not uh, yet off the ground. We'll launch it next year only. Information security. Information security is something that permeates all other areas of these national programs. We can actually we can think of many different things. But with all due respect to uh, my namesake from a Chinese company, or it could be a relative, a distant one. However, everything we are thinking of should be secure. We should keep everything, keep hands on everything going on in this country. People are asking me. How can we actually work by standards? 
What are information security standards? Who is developing information security standards in this country? Who knows this? Ven vendors do? Vendors, yes. Anybody else? The technical committees. Are there any? Thank you. Thank you very much. Digital economy is not developing any info security standards. So, what are we talking about? We are talking about resolution and, and laws 1 to 26 and 22. Are they international? Of course not. Of course not. Does the international community listen to them? This is a very simple, simple question. On the surface, we were the first in the world who invented the loading mechanism for a tank. And normally a tank will survive in a combat for five or six minutes only. Five, six minutes in combat. You may be talking about Armata, who is the new tank. Uh, let's talk about that at lunchtime, please. But we invented a new standard, say. We invented a new loading equipment for a tank, and then the tank's crew was reduced to three, and then uh, foreign companies started either buying tanks from us or they started implementing the standards themselves. I wanted to emphasize this. We can do everything, everything in the world. It only takes an effort. It takes some helping hand from the government and from the business community. Next slide, please. This is a brief um, list of people who are involved in those projects and centers of uh, competence and heads of working groups. They are all respected people from the business community, all very respected people, a deputy minister. Natalia Kaspersky is a chief of a working group on information security, and Mr. Kuznetsov is yet another head of working group. People from Rostec, Rosatom, Boris Nuralev is, well, they're all well-known people. They're, they're famous people, and they contribute to the development of this national program and federal projects. Next slide, please. Uh, why there is so little money involved in this national program? I, I, I ask you to pay attention to this slide, and people at the Presidium too. How many uh, leaders have been replaced except for Belousov? He changed his status from the presidential advisor, A, to the first vice prime minister. Uh, he works in an interesting structure. Three ministers has been ch has changed in the meantime. Every new one, a new minister comes to his post and say, "Go ahead, go ahead, keep working." So, to keep working, he needs to review the paradigms and see how things can be achieved. And he comes up with a lot of questions in the process. Look, there, is, there are different things, performance audit, and actually the cash implementation of the budget. So we shall look in two or three years' time as to the quality of uh, performance of these working groups. Well, this slide uh, concerns Decree 204 of the President, increase, accelerate technological advancement of Russia by 50 percent, increase uh, digital economic capacity three times over, be in the top five of the world economies. We're, we're working towards it. We're working. We keep working. And the program's budget, approved back in 2018, was 1.6 trillion rubles. 
Uh, they asked me an interesting questions yesterday. 23 trillion uh, rubles for 5G development. Next slide, please. Problems, okay. So, 23 trillions of what is monetary unit, I don't know. Difficult to say, but that was the amount of money invested in the development of 5G. Okay, okay. There, there we come. How does this federal project evolve? Initially, there's 500 different events. Then it was reduced to 393 uh, events. Then 144 events. Then Anton Silvanov said that we want to make part of uh, the federal budget, and the number was reduced further to 56, and the budget was not large at all. There used to be five major areas of the federal project development. Platform, import, substitution, standards, and new technologies. Some of this was implemented, some was not. The standard. The standard has been revised yet again recently, the, a couple of weeks ago. And what's the current status of it? We have two objectives, five indicators, 22 results. Three years ago, we used to have 500. Now we're talking about 22. Yes, they have become much more serious than before. And the grandeur has uh, kind of in in increased. You have one minute left, please. Next slide, please. Okay, okay, we can talk about that. We can talk about these goals and objectives. This is a list of goals and objectives. They're all linked to what we're trying to achieve. The presentations will be available to you. So don't, don't, don't worry, you will have a chance of, read through, to, of reading through it again. Uh, look, and why are we talking about the law enforcement agencies involved in these programs? A lot, really, a lot of money been channels for departmental objectives, the objectives that we are going to pursue and attain, particularly when it comes to the implementation of federal program and national projects. We have yet another federal project. And there is an, a development institute under it who are authorized to issue grants and subsidies for national projects. Previously, the co-financing scheme was 50-50. The Skolkova, the Bortnik Foundation, and others. So you can either apply to us or to the ministry, and they will give you a specific recommendation as to how to get be eligible for co-financing. So thank you for your attention. It was a pleasure talking talking to you. All right. Okay. Thank you, Nikolai Vladimirovich. Thank you so much indeed. Time is running fast. Time is flying. Mikhail Situgin. Uh, who is the chief of information security area at Skolkova? Dear participants, dear delegates, I have a presentation and I'd like to have it on, sc on, on the screen. Okay, all right. I represent an innovation center. I will be talking more about uh, the future, about what lies in store for us in the coming year. No, this is not my presentation. Right. That's, that's the one. Next slide, please. Every year, we come up with certain analysis. We're running an analysis every December. 
While some of the statistics apply to the year 2019, some to the year 2020. 2019 was a remarkable year in terms of investment in cyber security. What we had a lot of investors, an unprecedented amount of investors. However, earlier this year, we kind of slowed down due to the pandemic. And we, perhaps by the end of the year, we'll see some, some growth, hopefully. Next slide, please. Although the amount of investment in info security increased, while well, the situation is getting worse and worse year on year, we can see that we're seeing more cyber attacks and more fraud and more money stolen. Why is it happening? Well, there's the well-known Moore law, which says that the information security system's productivity grows exponentially. It keeps growing. Although, if we look at the number of software samples, malware samples, number of phishing letters, the number of vulnerabilities, they're growing, they're doubling or tripling every year. So their number is growing much faster than software productivity. In that sense, organic growth of cyber security tools and instruments cannot deal with the fast growth of uh, fraudulent attempts. Especially since they come up with new approaches and new techniques. Why is it happening? We've all come to face an increase of phishing attacks due to the pandemic. Like they, they, dub, they doubled, they tripled. However, this is nothing as compared to what we're going to face in three or four years' time. The Ratchet bots that are fully automated that will substitute humans, and you won't be able to tell the difference between a chatbot and a human. They can generate letters. They can trace uh, people's responses to, to their phishing letters, they, and they can modify. They, 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 they will transform. So we're going to see fully automated phishing schemes very soon. And the resources of chatbots is unlimited, meaning that the load on every user will grow immensely. The Internet of Things. So we expect 21.5 billion IoT devices by the year 2025. Uh, next slide, please. Well, this is the analysis we carried out last year, 2019. Uh, in, on cyber security. These are the areas that demonstrated fastest growth. They actually, they were growing by 24, 25% PA. And then we'll be showing you some investment dynamic a little later. Investment in information security. I believe that we'll publish something open source like the malware website, some in some uh, EE on our website too. Well, these are examples of new technologies that have, been, have migrated from fundamental R&D to applied research and implementations. Well, there are so many blank spots on the Russian market. I don't think they're all. Uh, the, the, this is so bad for Russia because we cannot actually take care of the entire technology stack in Russia, since we account for only one percent of the international uh, software market. 
When I was still in college, some of these areas were totally unprecedented, something we were talk we talked about as sci-fi. However, Microsoft and IBM and others are already racing for the productivity, like Huawei and the Russian uh, division is working to increase the hardware productivity of the morphic cryptography. Back in 2011, there was a surge of publications on the new cybersecurity area when the U.S. government announced that to be the key area of cybersecurity. It has he became, uh, it acquired a practical dimension a couple of years ago, and a lot of companies from the Fortune 500 list are now engaged in that. These are the high tech areas of cybersecurity on this list deception, artificial immune systems. Uh, very interesting, and the Dark Trace, a company from Great Britain, have been growing at record-breaking pace, and in less than three years, they achieved a capital uh, capitalization ratio of two plus billion dollars. And of course, some, some markets, and this market is overly regulated, and this may actually contain. Their, their growth as compared to other markets. Okay, we can uh, treat cybersecurity system development in different ways. This is how the uncertainty of the cybersecurity system's growth and uncertain threats that cannot be fully defined and perceived at the design stage. The first security are very archaic, perimeter-based security, when there is I say a perimeter that we define, and there are some users which are trusted and some other users which are not trusted. And then we come over to the third uh, generation where there is no perimeter. They're actually based on a user behavior. They would analyze traffic based on applications installed on a user's device. And a user may actually move his mouth on the monitor in a normal way, or may do that on an abnormal way. So his user patterns are defined and they're classified as uh, normal or abnormal. There are some deception instruments and immune systems. If I talk about investment attractiveness, that's the third generation systems take a leading position in technological investment, and this is the area which soaks up most of investment, like in the Silicon Valley and in China. But talking about Russia, we have a mirror image of, of the world. We are investing more in the archaic first generation information security systems. Um, and this may be a result of the import substitution process. There's uh, no need uh, to deal with the third generation system whilst we're not yet done with the first generation system. Now, there are some solutions uh, that we don't see yet. Uh, they are projects uh, implemented by a big hardware and software vendors. Some of them have not been announced yet, but we know that uh, they do R&D. Uh, we have a map of the third generation uh, developments which are now underway. We at Skolkova would like to uh, open a new cybersecurity format. Uh, in the past, we have been uh, seeing a lot of uh, startups that would come to us looking for customers, uh, looking for uh, big corporations that would pay attention to their ideas. Now we uh, try to focus on specific tasks. And this is a map that uh, seems uh, to be interesting. In the top right-hand corner, 
we have identified the technologies that will be most important in the field of cybersecurity for the next five years to come. Um, homomorphic encryption immune system based on IA, uh, polymorphic deception and armored protection. Uh, let us skip this chart in the interest of time. And um, I want to finish my presentation by giving you uh, some information about Skolkova. We have more than 50 cybersecurity related projects. We host events uh, like Cyber Day and Cyber Day Partners uh, to address uh, info security issues. We have uh, a support program for startups, and we also have uh, some opportunities for larger corporations. Not everyone knows about that, but we offer that service. We uh, consult uh, to people on matters of cybersecurity. We would be happy to see uh, pretty much everyone who comes our way. Uh, you uh, mentioned uh, fully homomorphic encryption. Uh, what uh, kind of uh, encryption is that? Well, that is a linear transformation. Only a linear transformation uh, can uh, be uh, that. Uh, Maybe uh, you learned about uh, Gaussian theory uh, in the university, and uh, this could uh, be very relevant uh, to this uh, transformation mechanism. Thank you very much. You should run away from this gentleman. Uh, I don't believe that uh, uh, this technology can be called new. Uh, it's been around for quite some time. Next presentation, Mr. Abakumov, head of Department of Information Technologies at Rosatom. He will talk about the import substitution efforts. This is the first time that uh, I participate in Info Forum, and uh, I must say that some presentations are very impressive. When I uh, looked at the subjects that are addressed by various speakers, I uh, was quite worried about uh, the projects that we are doing in our corporation. Anyway, uh, I was thinking about uh, the subject of the presentation, and then I thought that I would just tell you about what we do. We really are opening up uh, new dimensions in our paradigm in the field of information technologies. Uh, so that's what we would like to look at. We started uh, replacing foreign software uh, with uh, the Russian equivalents last year. It's also important uh, to uh, be independent in terms of hardware. We all know that in large corporations we use firewalls uh, that have high performance level and uh, they are sufficient for big systems. We had a presentation from Ross Register and I uh, would really love uh, to find out uh, what kind of uh, Russian made firewalls they are using uh, to support the number of transactions uh, which they have mentioned. The uh, schedule is very tight. Uh, the Ministry of Digital Development is uh, active in this. We know what uh, Russian software is approved and certified uh, for use in public agencies, and uh, we use that software uh, 
in our agency too. Uh, there are many pieces of software uh, that simply cannot replace uh, the software that people are using uh, made by international vendors. And this software is essential. Uh, big corporations need it. Uh, it's the foundation of many ecosystems that uh, agencies and uh, corporations have. It's essential to support research and development work as well as regular operation. We understand that this import substitution uh, program has a schedule and the schedule is extended. Uh, we know that the uh, task was set uh, to a complete transition to Russian software in January uh, 2021, and uh, agencies have to replace their hardware uh, with uh, Russian substitutes by 2022. But we don't have local solutions uh, to perform the same functions. In our industry, uh, well, we are a government agency. We are not covered by a 51R Act that deals with uh, these matters. However, we understand our responsibilities and we know what uh, is going on in the Russian software market. We have a lot of in-house development and uh, we offer our solutions to other people, uh, to big corporations in Russia and in other parts of the world. But we also use quite a lot of uh, software developed by other organizations. Uh, we have uh, looked at Resolution 486 by the Ministry of Digital Development, and uh, we have identified our objectives in this program. We needed to do serious preparation uh, for this import substitution, and uh, this is a journey that we have to travel together. Uh, we are transforming the entire software market in Russia. We have to create an ecosystem of software development. We need new laws. and. Uh, by laws, there's uh, still a lot of work that needs to be done. If we play with the import substitution uh, term and if we interpret it as a need to uh, replace a piece of software A with a piece of software B, uh, that is not going to give us the results we're looking for. We need to find better software solutions. That's what we sh should be working towards. And uh, I'm sure that digital economy uh, project is exactly after that. We have made some decisions in our agency, and um, uh, we are doing a lot more in the way of uh, our own in-house software development. However, whatever we buy uh, gets uh, reviewed by uh, experts. If we uh, develop a piece of software, we have to take into account uh, the entire technology stack that this software would have to live with in our systems. Uh, it's a matter of compatibility. We understand that uh, if we uh, work alone, uh, our work would be very uh, difficult. Uh, to complete successfully. So we joined efforts uh, with the uh, Russian Union of uh, Entrepreneurs and Industrialists. We appreciate their support. They are doing a lot of coordination between large uh, corporations and uh, public agencies. We understand that uh, we uh, spend money on the same types of software. We spend a lot of money on uh, testing and uh, development. When we work alone, uh, we uh, spend too much, and this is uh, far from the best way of uh, doing this task. 
So we work with uh, other people. We collaborate with Rostelecom, uh, the Mail of Russia, and several other people who are very actively involved uh, in this work. Together, we launched a number of initiatives. We have uh, drafted several new laws. I'm going to mention a few of them later in my presentation. Uh, we have big defense industry. The government is doing a lot uh, to uh, encourage them to use Russian software. When people are asking me if something else needs to be done, I usually say that we have to learn to use the tools that we have at our disposal instead of inventing something else. There are a lot of uh, tools. Uh, we have tons of software, but we need to use the software properly. Federal Law 223 uh, deals with import substitution in the field of software. This was a personal challenge for me. I uh, struggle to understand how we can use only domestic software. But we have some international commitments uh, that we also have to stick to, and that creates a problem. Uh, we understand that we are squeezed uh, between uh, these two parts today in any company, in any corporation with the government stake that is covered by uh, Federal Law 223. There are other laws uh, out there uh, that offer less flexibility, but Law 223 does not uh, open uh, a possibility uh, to choose uh, using any criteria other than price. And that is a dangerous path. Uh, this may put uh, Russian software developers in a better position, but then again, um, some of the Russian software developers may produce less uh, efficient software. We have to look uh, for a good balance uh, between price and quality. Uh, so many companies use simplified procurement methods when they buy from a single supplier. Uh, do you think uh, federal anti-monopoly service is going to like that? I don't think so. Then again, uh, there is another uh, alternative that uh, we have to uh, face. We have sent our proposals to the government and uh, they are now being reviewed uh, in the Federation Council in the Working Group on Digital Transformation. We really appreciate those efforts. Now we have a few propositions. I talked about uh, Federal Law 223. There's another interesting uh, piece of legislation that is uh, accelerated amortization rules. If you have uh, some foreign piece of software and then you have to replace it uh, with Russian equivalents, uh, that uh, would have uh, some uh, tax duties consequences. We have to really understand uh, where we're heading when we make those choices. It's uh, nothing special, but we have to be fully aware of uh, what we're doing. We would like to make some changes uh, to the register. We want to turn it into a knowledge product, uh, something that would include the best practices, uh, something that would help us to make a choice uh, between different uh, possible software options. Many companies out there uh, offer uh, bundled uh, software. Uh, many companies, many organizations, public agencies uh, buy packages of software. Uh, this uh, is all uh, fairly basic, 
But then again, uh, we start looking at uh, other people's experience. We see uh, what kind of feedback uh, is available on different uh, software that uh, uh, people market. This is generally all I wanted to address in my presentation. Thank you very much uh, to Info Forum for giving me an opportunity to speak. Uh, I have one more uh, comment uh, on the matter of cybersecurity. Uh, when we uh, start using Russian software, we uh, change the paradigm. Uh, this is uh, an entirely different uh, situation, uh, which is going to change uh, the uh, focus in the field of cybersecurity. I uh, know that uh, there are a lot of uh, computer engineers out there, and they will need uh, to learn new tricks. They will have to uh, learn how to use uh, Linux-based systems, which they have not played with uh, for many years. Many of them were growing up using Microsoft solutions, and now they have to change. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Adekunov. Thank you for joining us. Uh, yet another excellent presentation. I hope that you will be joining us in our future uh, events as well. Uh, let me invite the next presenter, Mr. Roman Kurmaev. Uh, he's uh, an engineer at Huawei Russia. Uh, Mr. Kormaev uh, will talk about import substitution trends and how this process drives local production. Many people today talked about uh, uh, domestic software, local development. I am going to talk about uh, hardware uh, because that is an important part of import substitution campaign as well. I uh, am going to tell you what uh, Huawei has to offer. Uh, companies and public agencies are encouraged uh, to use local products. Uh, this is a trend uh, that has been around for quite some time. Uh, let's uh, take a look at what has been achieved so far. Russian Federation has a development strategy that covers the period through 2030. But uh, that is uh, something that pretty much everyone knows about. It's all about more investment in uh, local software development and in uh, manufacturing hardware locally. Uh, the goal is to increase the volume of Russian market uh, to see better revenue level and other things of this nature. We have seen uh, organization of many committees, commissions, and uh, other entities to look after this matter. Uh, we have uh, new definitions now uh, that explain what can be considered to be local software, local hardware. In 2016, we have seen a number of new laws on procurements. Uh, everybody knows about those laws, and I don't want to spend time on that. Uh, the requirements uh, have become more stringent when the so-called Yaravaya law was passed. Uh, that law addresses uh, data storage. And again, this is a part of the import substitution campaign. Uh, critical data has to be stored locally on Russian soil. And um, in this context, I want to uh, talk about the options that Huawei has to offer. Uh, Huawei offers x86-based uh, solutions, and we also uh, have um, ARM architecture-based solutions. All Russian hardware vendors are going to be switching to ARM. Uh, the uh, reason is simple. Uh, the main competitor was MIPS, and uh, they went broke. Uh, therefore, all R&D that we're going to see in hardware is going to be uh, based on ARM architecture or 
uh, some other architectures that may be proposed by local talents. Uh, we have a few solutions uh, that are using ARM architecture. ComBank uh, is a processor. It's a processor for servers up to 64 cores on one chip. We work by the local laws and we uh, try to launch production in Russia. North Trans is one of our Russian partners. They have a lot of experience in building servers, uh, the servers that are compliant with Russian legislation. And uh, they have launched uh, a number of uh, production projects. We know that uh, this is very good practical experience. So that uh, collaboration uh, is one way to start producing Huawei products locally in Russia. Uh, we start with simple things and uh, then uh, do more complex things. Uh, at first, uh, we uh, start making uh, Kunpeng uh, processors. We started by importing uh, servers. We offered them to local engineers, and uh, they had to decide what they could build locally. Uh, they started with uh, the shells, uh, the simple thing. Then uh, they added a power source manufacturing and uh, that increased uh, the share of local components. In the next phase, uh, we started using local uh, software, BIOS and other things, motherboards and uh, processors. Then we launched serial production of servers. However, this was not enough uh, for this product to be considered made locally we uh, saw a new series of tasks. Uh, we uh, needed to develop interfaces like uh, PCI Express uh, and uh, extension boards. We uh, were uh, bringing in uh, the uh, motherboards that uh, we used uh, as a basis of production. This was not an easy thing uh, to do uh, because of the uh, quality considerations. In the next phase, uh, we uh, localized uh, the fabrication of motherboards. In the end, we should import uh, only chips and uh, we should produce servers as the end uh, product, a simple scenario that we want to turn into reality. Norsi Trans is not the only partner uh, that we have here. We are looking for other people as well, and we are open for ideas and suggestions. We know that uh, many people are using our processors in their manufacturing in Russia. Here are a few names. RTE is one of them. We have very close cooperation uh, that is based on the same model. Norsi Trans was one of the uh, first people that uh, we started doing business with, and uh, this journey is not over yet. We'll uh, see where it takes us. Uh, we uh, have accomplished the mission of hardware substitution, but that is not all. We would like to start using Alt Linux and Astro Linux the most popular uh, platform is Astra that uh, many Russian software developers are using. We have several things to offer. We can offer our servers uh, to conduct testing at the uh, developers' sites. Uh, many people are using Russian software, and uh, we 
I know about that. We know that uh, an organization might want to use our service, so we would provide them service for the phase of testing. Uh, then uh, they can easily uh, test the software and see how it runs on our servers. Uh, that uh, uh, offer of servers uh, helps people uh, to start using our hardware and uh, Russian developed uh, software. Uh, like I said, uh, most people are using ARM architecture. We uh, are a member of a kit association. Astro Linux and Alt uh, Linux, as well as many other people, are also a part of that. We talk to them, we uh, consult uh, to them as they make transition uh, to new technology stacks. Uh, we believe that most Russian uh, vendors are going to be using uh, this technology stack. We are switching to ARM architecture, and this is not something that one can do overnight. We are doing a lot of pilots. Uh, we are using uh, some foreign uh, hardware. And if you join these testing efforts early, uh, your life will be much easier in the future. You will learn about the problems and challenges that you will be uh, faced with. The architecture itself uh, presents uh, quite a few challenges. ARM is not changing much, even if you buy the next generation, of course, uh, from vendors. We are still going to support compatibility, and it will remain basic ARM. That's all I have. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'm ready to take them now. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, let us uh, take questions offline. People can ask questions during lunch. Now I'm passing the floor to the next presenter, Sergei Pospelov. Uh, he is uh, a, a secretary in parliamentary assembly of uh, Organization of uh, Collective Security. He will talk about uh, the models of uh, legal mechanism development uh, in digital space. Hello, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to everyone in this room and to those who are uh, joining us online. In my presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, the lawmaking efforts, uh, the international uh, part of it. I'm very happy that I've been here in this session and I listened to so many presentations. Many people talked about regulations, laws, and bylaws, and uh, need uh, to create uh, new regulations. I realize that uh, we are interested uh, in making our legal system better. Information security is a very relevant uh, matter uh, for countries that are members of Treaty on Collective Security. We need to protect our sovereignty. Uh, that is a priority for all of us. Integration between our countries is growing. and. Uh, at the same time, uh, we see new challenges uh, for security of different types, and that includes information security. When we create uh, the same legislation for cybersecurity, we make uh, our work much easier, and that's uh, exactly our task in our mission. I have a few charts uh, that I want to show you to uh, demonstrate what our parliamentary assembly is doing. It has been around since 2008. Uh, we have issued several laws which are not compulsory. Uh, they are more of recommendations. We have quite a lot of uh, such acts. We uh, see quite a lot of interest that other uh, countries are showing towards uh, what we do. Uh, China is paying a lot of attention, uh, and it uh, is looking for 
active collaboration with us. In our parliamentary assembly, uh, we have uh, seen many guests uh, from China, Iran, Pakistan, and other countries. This uh, may sound like old markets for some people, especially for some of today's presenters. Uh, still, let me tell you that uh, the countries that are members of our treaty uh, have been working towards a common economic space. Uh, we're now joined by Serbia and Afghanistan. There's over 15 countries that are interested uh, in having common sets of laws uh, which could be the basis for digital integration and cooperation. We use various models uh, for uh, making laws, and uh, then national parliaments would endorse those laws at a national level. Here are some model acts that parliamentary assembly has approved, and now those acts are reviewed at uh, national level. Uh, cyber threats have been reflected in a number of those laws that you see on the screen. There are some new drafts that we are now working on, and uh, that's what I would like to uh, talk to you about. To that end, we have a special organization. The par parliamentary monitoring exercise that we have conducted provides indicates that the potential for the use and implementation is huge. Well, you can actually look up uh, our website for uh, legislature, various member countries, and what kind of regulations are already in place. And I believe that there is an interest and there is a need for such regulatory norms which may not be fully endorsed in some other member countries. To, uh, to catch up with that, we are having uh, regular meetings with our working groups. Not everything can be achieved in the online mode, but hopefully next year, next parliamentary year, we will have a whole series of research conferences so that we could talk to developers. We have the new Bowman uh, University, the Miria University, and other universities from our member states in terms of upgrading legislation. Well, there are some model laws, model temp template laws, which are on this slide. You can read it up if if interested. We could work together on that. In particular, here are a couple of model laws that might be of interest to you. We're currently talking about a concept law on information security and action plan uh, on countering um, cyber threat challenges and illegal financing using cryptocurrencies and several other topical issues, something that will become the laws of our <laughs> member states in some time. We are working for the benefit of our regulators and our counterparts in member states so that they could work in a uniform legislative environment. For the Time passed from the previous forum, and I'd like to use this opportunity to thank organizers. We have been working on several model laws with our colleagues. So I invite others to join in. We are open to this work. We have a consultative council which has been working most actively, and we'll welcome our cooperation on that. Thank you. Thank you, Sergei Valerievich. And Yelena Zinoviva will make the concluding speech of this session. She's a deputy director of the Center for International Information Security and Research and Technology Policies at um, GIMO of the MFA of Russia. 
Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for this opportunity to sit in and to, uh, to listen to your presentations at the at, uh, Info Forum. So much has already been said about threats to information security. I would like to focus on a, another issue of how we and uh, our center believes we could pursue international cooperation in line with information security challenges. Can you demonstrate the next slide, please? Right. Well, there are, there are two buttons there, forward and backward. Right. OK. Right. Thank you. I would like to say, to, to say, first of all, that there is a common denominator of international cooperation. And digital sovereignty is such common denominator. Well, there's been so much practical dimensions of the digital sovereignty and machine learning, import substitution. However, political scientists and political analysts define sovereignty as the supremacy of power nationally and supranationally. So we believe that the supremacy of authority of government power in pursuing information policies is the sovereignty per se. And um, other speakers were focused on technical aspects of the topic mainly. mainly, however, while there are other aspects to digital sovereignty. The definition of information security should be based on the concept of digital sovereignty and the security of national interests, both in, in the area of technology and personal data protection and content. This is all based on the sovereignty of power. When the internet was just in the making, and when American developers were taking the lead, well, the internet back in those times was perceived as a free community. However, uh, our current policies and practices believe that this, that the internet is treated and is perceived by the prism of security. And everything going on on the internet should be based on the concept of sovereignty. I believe that this concept is generally broadening. And I can conclude from the presentations I've heard, people are now increasingly often talking about the sovereignty of data and technological sovereignty. And we, political uh, researchers, are trying to, to put this in a political framework. Russia adopted some amendments to the law on communications last year, 2019, and uh, on ensuring digital sovereignty. It's curious that two initiatives aiming at data sovereignty were put forward earlier this year, the digital strategy of the European Union, which actually offers to localize data and introduce restrictions on foreign companies, which is yet another step forward to s digital sovereignty. And the global initiative on data security offered by the China, put forward by uh, the Ch China, by China. Well, since I'm the last speaker, then I would like to outline the most recent Russian foreign policy initiative in the domain of digital sovereignty and based on the doctrine of digital security dating back to 2016. 
So we can actually identify several initiatives which all stem from the United Nations Charter. United Nations is the cornerstone, and the UN Charter is the cornerstone of international law, which um, embeds pr principles, universal principles, the non-use of force, the non-interference in internal affairs, and many others. Uh, the digital medium actually raises new challenges in each of those. Say, a set of rules of responsible conduct. And we are offering to actually formalize these fundamental principles embedded in the UN Charter and try to adapt them to the digital world. Then there is the UA a draft UN concept on information security. The pandemic has brought about many challenges and many problems. However, it expedited di digitalization. And in, over the past six months, we covered a way which would have normally taken three years at least. And we believe that the initiative of promoting universal concept on countering cyber crime to counterbalance the Budapest concept of the Council of Europe, which is based on digital security. I believe that the entire operations of law enforcement authorities and crime prevention, crime detection, and punishment should be based on respect of national sovereignty. We also introduced several new concepts which um, technical experts have been discussing today. We also want to promote the UN concept of the safe operation and development of the Internet. So far it has been Western-centered. We believe, yes, yes, I, I, I'm about to, to finish my presentation. We want this practice to be applied to the new realities and to new R Russian foreign policy initiatives. And the United Nations policies or UN umbrella organizations like the ITU should also take care of, uh, take care of promoting this new concept. And it, it may actually form the groundwork for a new international regime of information security. It should be form the basis for all nations. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, friends, I think we have completed our list of speakers today. And I would like to thank all speakers now. Would you like to give them a round of applause? Thank you. And, and I would like to return this applause to you for your interest, for your attention, and for our technical team, which have done their best to make this session happen.